Wonderful, man, wonderful. Be seated. Thank you. Well, it's great to see you. Hope you've had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas week. And uh, I suppose, you know, we could just spend the rest of today just telling stories about all the things and family and gifts, lots of good food, great fellowship, you name it. Well, it's uh, wonderful to be here, and I appreciate, I appreciate you being here today. I just want you to know, and I love each one of you and just thank the Lord for you. What a great time of worship with our Genesis band and see each other. And I just pray that as we go into the next decade, which is just amazing to me, it's just amazing. That's what we're doing. We're finishing out another decade, 2020. You know something really interesting that happened like a hundred years ago before I was born? Just something seriously interesting happened uh, oh, just over a hundred years ago. This time, a hundred years ago, they were getting over the First World War. My grandfather was in it. So why am I telling you that? Because it's like some of you, some of us. I'm not exempt. When you look to a new year, we make all kinds of decisions. And just maybe somebody here today, you're about to just sign a piece of paper Six months from now, you're going to do it again. Just check out this video with me for a second. It's great. I watched it. want you to see it. We stand at the edge of this new year. These 365 days in front of us. And instead of letting them blow by us, we look each of them in the eye. And one by one. We live them with intention. 365 days of sheer purpose. Each lived like it's the only day we've got. What if I live every day like no other day is owed to me? I'd reach out to my dad, make things right before it's too late. On my sister's birthday this year, I'd call instead of text. I would wake up in the morning and I would ask God what he wants me to do. I'd take those vacation days I still haven't used. Instead of inviting her to coffee, I'd invite her to church. Make myself get up early so I can watch cartoons with my kids. I'd give myself a break. I would take her to that park she's been wanting to go to, the one that's all the way across town. I'd say I love you, and I'd say it every day. On Thanksgiving, my table would be open to the whole neighborhood. Mother's Day would mean more than a $5 card. I'd let God have all the stuff weighing me down. I'd have more courage, because I'd have nothing to lose. I would take Jesus seriously when he asked us to feed the hungry. Serve the very least of these. Look after the sick. I'd be quicker to forgive because He forgave me. Living every moment with intention. Taking every purpose by the horns. Leaving nothing unsaid. Leaving nobody behind. Making every minute count. I would use every hour I had on this earth. To love God. To love others. One intentional day at a time. Okay, so my mother died a week ago, and we buried her, sent her, celebrated her life on Friday. If my mother was here now, would you think I'm corny if I told you I would absolutely go and tell her that I loved her? That's how important that would be. <laughs> so if you told that you love them today, Do you hug your kids? What'd you do last night? Were you too busy? <laughs> do you prefer texting over actually talking to some people you really love? Because talking is a bit of a nuisance. I don't know, whatever... So, watch this now. I'm going to show you something. 
I mean, this is really, this has got all over me. So in the Old Testament of the Bible, before Jesus came to this earth and gave his life and became the new covenant, where was God? Anybody know? I mean, I know he was everywhere, but he was in a specific place. All right, I'm just going to answer my own question. He was in the Ark of the Covenant. How many of you have heard of the Ark of the Covenant? Raise your hands. Right? They've even made movies, The Lost Ark and so on. Okay, but the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Old Testament, in that wooden box, that's where God was. So now get this. This is really interesting. If you go back into the Old Testament, when God delivered the children of Israel out of bondage, He set them free. He took them away from their oppression to deliver them to the promised land, this act of redemption. Everywhere they went, they took God with them. The Ark of the Covenant. So if you ever want to do this, it's a wonderful study in your own private time. Just go and track the number of times that God's people fought battles with the Ark of the Covenant. They won the battle, and then they pushed the Ark of the Covenant to the side, or they left it outside the door, or they moved on and didn't bring it with them. You know what happened every time? They did it again. Every time. Every time they left God out, they ended up facing life on their own, and they couldn't do it. It didn't matter how many nations signed up. It didn't matter how good they were, what resolutions they made. They took the Ark of the Covenant, they moved God out, and they lost. They killed each other, they fought, they squabbled, they jostled for position, and you think the United States Congress is only now? The United States Congress was all over the Israelites every time they moved God out. It looked just like the U.S. Congress. Stalemate, arguing, fighting, demeaning, belittling, pointing fingers. In God we trust. So I'm, I'm going to show you something. I want to give you a minute here today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. So if you've got an app and you want to look it up, now is a good time. 1 Chronicles 13. 1 Chronicles chapter 13. I really want, this is a great passage. You may want to take part of this passage and make it part of your new year. Make it part of your future. And I strongly urge you, because it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about your church, it's not about your political affiliation, it's not about your favorite team, it's not about the colors you wear, it's not about whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl, it's about the Lord Jesus. And so when we get to First Chronicles chapter 13, we find King David. All of us know about David, David and Goliath, and all the things that went on with David, King David. And before David was King Saul. So this here is part of the culminating story about just two people. And when David became king, this is what happened. This is what he did. I'd like to just read you the first four verses. David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and every leader. And David said to all 
of the nation of Israel. If it seems good to you, and from the Lord our God, let us send out to all our brothers and sisters who remain in the land of Israel, as well as to the priests and the Levites in the cities that have pasture lands, that they may be gathered to us. Then let us, watch this, bring the ark of our God to us, because during the time of Saul, we did not seek it. The assembly, all the people agreed, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now, I want you to just get this, because there are two people here. It's like you and somebody, David and Saul. Now, I want to tell you a couple of things the Bible tells us about these two individuals. Number one, they were both had God on their side. Just like you. Saul, David, both of them had God on their side. Both of them had a relationship with God, Jehovah. Both got it when it came to the ark. Very important. There's someone today listening to me right now. You're that person. And you know it. I'm going to talk about where the ark is right now in your life. But both of these men had God on their side. Both of these men had enormous potential. God had given them more potential than you could shake a stick at. <laughs> you know, about a week ago, I was here in the city and I got into a conversation with a person. They don't come to our church or anything, but wonderful people. And this particular person, we were just chatting and I, I just happened to say, you know, I tell you, it was last Monday, two days before Christmas. I just have to say, man, have a wonderful time. What you're doing for Christmas is all the family coming in. That was my statement. And this person said to me, well, most of us are coming. I said, what do you mean most of us? And this lady said to me, well, I can't explain it to you. But you know, my other siblings and I, we're not perfect, <laughs> but we all love the Lord, and our parents love the Lord, and we try to get on, and, and we're happy, and, but we've got one sibling who won't even bother to come home for Christmas. You know anybody like that? We've got one person doesn't live for the Lord, defies God, wants nothing to do with the Ark of the Covenant. You know someone like that? The interesting thing about David and Saul, when you look at them, they both had God on their side, and both of them had enormous potential. And this very precious person looked at me and said, but the thing about our sibling is she may not be interested and she doesn't want and she's against everything, but she's got so much potential if she would just get her heart right with God. You know someone like that? The ark's not in your heart. 
Or maybe the ark has been in your heart and you've moved the ark outside the home of your heart. That's what Saul did. They both had enormous potential. By the way, I've got to just say this. They both had great support. <laughs> I love this story. You know, when you go and study about Saul and you look at him, he was surrounded by amazing support. You know, when you look at David, just think about his mighty men. You can read about it in the previous chapter, in chapter 12, the mighty men, the leaders. You know, when David got up to speak, he gathered everybody. He spoke to the leaders and the counselors and the wonderful people. They had an unbelievable level of support, just godly, unbelievable people around them. Do you know what happened to me last night? So I'd made up my mind that I was going to watch a few really good ball games. My son, Rob, came to me. He's been chaplain, volunteer chaplain of the New Orleans Saints. He's in his 10th year. So he knows everybody. He comes to me and Greg, and he says, Dad, you know the Saints are playing down there in Carolina, you need to come down there with us, and I want you to speak to the New Orleans Saints. So I didn't say, ah, oh, no, no, you know, the ball game. So Greg, me, Rob jumped in the motor car yesterday afternoon. We went to Charlotte, found a great restaurant, ordered all the wings in the entire restaurant, and we at least watched the first half of the LSU uh, game, at least the first half of it. Then we up and off we go to the hotel, and all these famous people are there, and Drew Brees, who's just an incredible person, amazing, just, I just admire him so much, great family man, just loves the Lord. So there's Rob and me and Greg with all of these New Orleans saints, and Rob gets up and he reintroduces me because I've had the privilege of doing this a number of times, and he says the nicest thing ever. Speaking on behalf of Greg, and I know Shelley. He says, you know, this is my dad, and the thing that I want you to know about my dad is he's our, he's our mentor, teaches us. He never stops talking and advising us and counseling us, and he's just said a lot of nice things. And then I get up there to speak to all these famous people. Do you know what I said to them? I said, gentlemen, I want you to know something. I love my sons, my daughter, very, very much. I'll always be dad. I promise you, I'll always be dad. But I can't describe to you what it's like for me today. Because actually, if you want to know the truth, they teach me. They love me. They counsel me. They are showing me. They are guiding me. I watch them. I watch them preaching. I watch them loving on people. I watch how they understand the world in which they live. I, they understand next gen. I hang on to every word. I ask them their opinion. And I said to the New Orleans Saints, I said, my sons are my greatest counselors. And I haven't even started. Just look at this. Excuse me for a minute. Do you know what level of friendship you and I have sitting in this room from Stanley Biggerstaffs? I shouldn't have started names. I said, don't do it. I can go up and down. Eddie, Brad, I can go up and down this room here. Corey, this room here, upstairs and downstairs, John Langford sitting up there, one of my closest counselors. I'm looking into your faces, Kaz McCaslin over it. Brother, thank you for loving me the way you do and sticking with me and advising me and counseling me. I value you and I value. I look around this room. They're all over the place. These two men, listen up here. Listen up here. Jacob, you know what? I want to tell you something, brother. Thank you for being a real friend to me, brother. Thank you. 
I, I value you. Matthew, I value you. Thank you for being my friend. Todd, thank you. Colby, thank you. Listen, God, just excuse me. Excuse me a minute. Put that phone down. And I haven't seen a phone. What I'm saying to you is, are you getting this? Are you... Excuse me. I'm giving you gold. Otherwise, all you'll do is 18 years from now, your war will break out again. Because all you're doing is signing a meaningless piece of paper. And it doesn't matter how many yahoos you gather around you all to sing your praises and to tell you, whoop de doo we're all going to do this together. If it's the wrong counsel, forget it. Two men, David, Saul, both God on their side, both enormous potential, both had great support, <laughs> both had sin to deal with. Hey, let's not get away with this one. How much time have we got to talk about the sin of Saul and the sin of David? Do you know that the Bible says all of us, every single one of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God? We're all sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. And you have to deal with your sin. You have to confess that and repent of that sin before God. And it'll never happen if you don't bring your ark back. Not going to happen. I'll even give you a great southern phrase. It ain't going to happen. That never sounds the same when I say it. Got to bring your ark back. And of course, most of all, these Two men had choices to make. <laughs> By the way, I didn't even read this passage. But you know, in, in chapter 10, can I just read this to you? I don't want to read it because it's not nice. Listen to what the Bible says about Saul. So this is verse 13 of 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Because I know many of you take notes and I commend you for it. Don't stop doing that. 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. So Saul died because of his breach of faith. <whistles> Woo! That's not popular in America. So Saul died because of his breach of faith. It doesn't stop there. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the commandment of the Lord, and he also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He went to an astrologer. He consulted the stars. He went to the witch of Endor. So who's your witch of Endor that you've been talking to? God says... Don't do it. Hello? God. It's right here. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. He went to some poor, lame, idiotic lady who sat in a box somewhere that thought that she could speak in behalf of God, and God said, I am the Lord your God. Thou shalt make no other gods before me. The Bible says he did not seek guidance from the Lord. By the way, do you know what happened to Saul? He died a horrible death on Mount Gilboa. He ended up on a hillside, but here's the greatest tragedy of all. Man, I don't like this. 
You know that his son Jonathan paid the price alongside his daddy. Jonathan? He was a nice guy. Do you know something? Could I just say something to you dads right now? Every time you move the ark of the Lord's covenant out of your life, your kids pay the consequence. Can't tell you, my kids are grown. I've got four, eight grandkids now. <laughs> It just so many things with my little people. And I just keep saying, please, make sure. Go and hug them. Love on them. Tell them you love them. Over and over and over again. At what point do you think a child gets tired of getting a big hug from his or her daddy? But man, don't bother me right now. I got, I got this thing I've got to look at. Yeah? What's that? Oh, okay, man. Just, you know, I'm busy. So here's what we'll do. I'm going to do this real quick. What I thought we'd do is I want to give you four or five practical suggestions on how to bring your ark back. Is that good? All right, number one, practical, number one, taken from God's Word. Number one, consider who you belong to. Question is, who do you actually belong to? My sons will tell you last night, with extremely famous people sitting in front of me, not because I want to be a hero, I didn't do that. You've all heard me do it. I hope I'm consistent. I try to be. I'm hypocritical a hundred thousand times a year because I'm a sinner. But I will tell you, last night, in all the things, I suddenly stopped. I said, I want you New Orleans Saints football players to know something about me. I'm a Christian man. Jesus lives in my heart. I love the Lord, and that's all really that matters to me. How are you doing? How are you doing? Can you imagine saying that to some famous person? Who do you belong to? If I was to come out here today, which I'm not going to do, but if I, if I was to come out here and we started on the front row, I know my precious friend Michaela loves the Lord. You can just see it all over her face. <laughs> We just start with her, my sister here. Go to Hannah, and we just ask you to get up and say, excuse me, who do you, hey, who do you belong to? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Number two, consider who your friends are. Consider who your friends are. Just think of the circle that was there, especially around David. Saul didn't listen. I could spend the rest of today telling you and showing you. David, many times, when David didn't listen, he paid the price. You better listen. Consider who your friends are. Who are you hanging with? Where were you last night? This last week? Where's your affection? Who do you gravitate toward? Who are you hanging out with? Where do you drink from? You, you think you're some kind of big cheese because you can stand there with the boys and act like a total idiot all the time and all you're doing is surrounding yourself with absolute rubbish. And then you turn around and you wonder why you're not surviving. Bring the ark back. This is what we all do. My lowest points in my life have been when I've done exactly that. I can tell you times as a 
teenager and as a young person, and even in my adulthood, when I gravitated toward the wrong people, I moved the ark of God's covenant out of my life. I hang around wrong people in order to lead them to Jesus. I don't hang around wrong wrong people to look like them, behave like them, or to get counsel from them. But I tell you something, if it means that I can go into that pub over there and hang out with the purpose of reaching people for Jesus, I'm going to the pub. But I'm going there asking God to help me get alongside them, not to become like them. How do we bring the ark back into our lives? Consider you belong to your friends. Consider your commitment to Christ. It really all comes down to that. That's always my big battle, you know, I just... You know, Lord, I've given my heart to you, and I know I love you, and you love me so much, and you never leave me, and you're always so gracious to me, and you keep on forgiving me. Consider your commitment. You know, it's like marriage, you know. I mean, my duckling and I, being, I just love her, but at the least, at the bottom line, this precious lady, the least thing I can do is just love her back. Can you feel that? She doesn't deserve for me to diss her. Doesn't deserve for me to speak badly to her. She doesn't deserve that. Doesn't matter. That's a discipline. Because words are said and things are said and circumstances arrive. Number four, just consider your priorities. Just get up. You know, like that little video clip that I gave you. Just, I don't know what it is. may have to do something to do with your phone, where you go, who you hang with, the time you give, where you serve, your church, your faithfulness. Just consider your priorities. What is important to you? You know, we have all these cute sayings, but they're true. God first, family second. close friend, you know, what do you, and what does that mean? What are your priorities in life? Because I'm telling you, you are going to gravitate toward what you prioritize based upon the ark of your covenant. Not based upon a piece of paper that you signed. And then one more, I'll close it. Just consider the choices that you have to make. You want to bring the ark of your covenant back. Now watch what happens here. I wrote this down because I don't want to forget this. This is good stuff here. Ready? You know what happens when you bring the ark of your covenant back into your heart? When you bring Jesus back into his rightful place? That's the place of your commitment. It's what you're bringing back. When you bring back the ark of your covenant, you're bringing the home of your affections. The home of your affections. You're bringing back the beat of your pulse. It's what will make you tick. You're bringing back the line of your sand. You're bringing back the non- of your negotiable. Now that's a nice how do you do. When you bring back the ark of God's covenant, you bring back into your life the non of your negotiable. So if someone was to say to you, what's non-negotiable in your life? Do you know that? And how do you make that? What, is, what are some things that you have in your life? No. I mean, what part of no do you not understand? I don't do that. I don't drink that. I don't take that. I don't talk like that. 
I don't, whatever it might be. No. I don't go there. You bring back the ark of God's covenant into your life. It is the very basic fundamental fabric. It's the non of your negotiable. And of course, mostly importantly, it's the heart of your resolve. <laughs> I've, I've uh, well, I guess that's it. I've come to the conclusion I can't do this life unless the ark is in my heart. I can't do it. So you're a pretty bright spark if you can. I can't do it. I can't do it. We can't do it, folks. But watch this. <laughs> God can. God can. Now that's a new year for you. I'm going to ask our band to come and join me. Begin to play quietly here. It's just like this. We're about to close. And I haven't eaten a decent meal in at least six or seven hours. I can't wait to have lunch. Some of you are going to say, now wait a minute now. How can you be so happy when we get to the end of a service? This is the happiest time of a worship service. Because I believe, watch this, I believe right now, you're God's fish, and He just caught you. He's reeling you in. He just caught you, and He's reeling you in. God is. It's right deep down, isn't it? You know, I, I think this year can be the most fantastic year ever for you and for me, for us. We're friends. We love each other. We're neighbors. God's on our side. So we're going to stand in a minute. I'm going to ask you if you'd like to come today, whether you're upstairs, downstairs. I've got so many of my friends. Matthew's here and Todd, Caitlin's here, and Colby, and Laura, and I just keep going around the room here. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to just come today. Come. Step it out. Say, man, I'm here. I'm resolved. I'm ready. I'm bringing the ark of God's covenant back into my life. Let's stand together. You come as we begin to I sing. I believe come. in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit.
this your baby sister? How big is she? Is she one? How big are you? Two? Three. You nearly four. Do you know when I was three, I used to be your age? I did. And you are looking so pretty. Did you have a lovely Christmas? I know you did. And it was so much more funner having Lillian here, hey? I mean, that was made just the best, even though you got mommy and daddy. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are precious, man. We just love you so much. And we celebrate with you today. Lord Jesus, I just thank you with all of God's people today. You know, thinking about David bringing all the people together, gathering them. In many ways, this is kind of like that. And we just come to celebrate with this most precious family. Lord, you've blessed them with two beautiful little girls. And now little Lillian. Lord Jesus, we know she and Emmy are going to just grow up as two sisters. Who knows what they're going to get up to? It's the best fun in all the world. You're going to bless them so much. I pray for mommy and daddy today that you'd give them great wisdom and you'd bless them in everything they do so that we can grow up as young ladies and that we would love Jesus. And now... I'm going to go to Chief, just for a little bit. Can we do that? If Ducky, Ducky's going to take you home. Oh, what a little doll. Lord Jesus, thank you for precious. No, 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 look. Look at everybody. See? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for precious little girl today. She is so beautiful, and we just love her. I lay my hands upon her today and I just bless her in the name of the Lord Jesus. God, her heart, bless her, strengthen her. May she grow up to be a strong lady for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's that little song, Kiss the Girls and Make Them Cry? <laughs> Get out of here, Dad. You're just putting a number on me here. I love you. Let's give God a hand, folks. Come on. Thank you. Love you both very much. All right, so check out the first, what's going on in our church. Check this out for a second. Here's your first look at some of what's going on here at First Spartanburg. What a wonderful Christmas season here at FBS. Thank you, church family, for the many ways that you have given above and beyond. You have all shared the love of Jesus in so many ways, and we pray that the spirit of giving will continue on into the new year. As we look ahead, it's time to mark your calendars for the Wild Game Dinner, February 6th and 8th. You can register online now at fbs.org slash wildgame. For either night, tickets are $15 for adults and $10 for children under 12. This is always a special time of gathering together, and the tickets will go fast. Don't wait. Register now and pray about the friends God wants you to bring. Kid Depot Impact Workshops kick off January 8th. Don't forget to register online because spots are limited. These workshops take place Wednesday nights for kids in grades 1 through 5. Head to fbs.org slash tkdevents to sign up. Next week is our first fruits offering to kick off the new year. It's a wonderfully practical way to help with our ministry at the bridge. We need you to consider bringing canned meats, canned pasta, such as Spam and SpaghettiOs, to help us help others who are desperately in need. More details are online at fbs.org bridge. Don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on all the things that happen here at First Baptist. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Until the next first look, let's keep looking for more ways to love God and love those He puts in our path this week. Wonderful. Uh, just want to tell you, we've got a very special friend here today. Beck Scales is here from South Africa. And some of you may remember her, some of you may not, but she's serving the Lord in 
Cape Town, South Africa for the last, what, how many years, Beck? 11 years. And her two daughters are with her. And it's just so precious to have them here with us today, all the way from the southern tip of Africa. Let's give her a big welcome, shall we? Well, Doc, what an incredible message. Such a powerful uh, challenge for us as we enter into 2020. Uh, I know we all like to make New Year's resolutions, and uh, usually mine in start with, you know, run every day of the new year. And I don't think I've ever ran on January 1st ever. So I'm not too good at that. Um, but I really decided to challenge myself this year with where is my focus? Uh, is my focus with the Lord or is it with me? Um, and I challenge you guys with that today. Is your focus with the Lord or is it with you? Uh, as we go into 2020, um, we are a church that loves everybody. Uh, and there are thousands of people here in Spartanburg that don't know Christ. Uh, what an incredible thing it would be if, if j- each one of us just shared with one person in the next month. Shared w- with one person about Jesus in the next month. I think that would just be an incredible thing. And also, um, as we go into the new year, uh, where are your priorities in life? Uh, With your finances, with your family, uh, I challenge you to just put your priorities with Christ. And let's take a look at this video, uh, a testimony from one of our our families uh, about So here we are, Judane. Can you believe they asked us to speak? (laughs) No, I cannot. (laughs) What a blessing though, right? Yeah, oh, definitely. We're definitely. truly blessed. Yes. And so what is, what, why have we been asked to speak? And, and speaking today, we've been asked to speak on giving. Mm-hmm. And so here we are at the end of the year, 2019. We're going into a new decade, and we want to go into it with a surge, and, and we want to give it our best, and we want to give to God what He deserves. And so I'd just like to take a minute to ask you, Judine, how, is it possible to have to give the Lord? Never. Never is it. No, No, and I tell you what, I think about the tithe, I think of it as a foundation. You know, I think, you know, we want to build on that foundation, and out of that foundation comes the giving. And so what I'm thinking is at this time of year, Judine, that we need to ante up more. You think we could give more? Always. Always. You know, I think about, you know, the fact that I believe if you gave the the Lord the shirt off your back, I believe you'd get three back and they'd be Mm -hmm. brand new. You know, you just can't out giving. But I think back on a time... Judine, when we didn't tithe, when we we gave randomly, you know, and and then every now and then we might feel encouraged to, you know, give a little special offering, sort of like what we're talking about right now, maybe a little something special toward the end of the year. But really what we're talking about here is not just a special offering. Yeah, we would love to see that everyone would prime that that giving tank, if you will, that fuel in that ministry by giving something special right here at the end of the year. But the truth of the matter is, if we all join in and give systematically according to Scripture, I go back to Malachi 3.10, where it's the only place in the Bible where I know that God says, test me in this and I'll prove you. And we did it, didn't we, Judy? Mm-hmm. We tested him, and what happened? Abundance. Abundance. He has given us an abundance. And so we're truly blessed. So I challenge you to consider this Scripture I want to read, because I, I thought, you know, whenever the church asks you to say a word, you got to have some Scripture, right? And so uh, I actually pulled this from... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and this is actually talking about motivations for giving and the scripture that that I went to since I've always loved Malachi 310 I thought maybe this would be a good scripture to consider as well when it comes to giving because Malachi 310 talks about the foundation and tithing we're talking about giving above uh, above that now and so Malachi uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 7 says each person should do as he has decided in his heart not out of regret or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, we shouldn't be bullied into giving. Nobody forced us to give, did Uh they, Judine? We just answered the call. We had a brother that showed us something and opened our eyes. God used him Mm -hmm. to open our eyes, and and we decided after reading Malachi 3.10, we would just take that challenge and test him in it, and it's it's worked out very well, hasn't it? It You can't out give him. You know what I thought? I thought if we give away all this stuff, we wouldn't have anything. Oh, that's a myth. So I reckon I just challenge you going into 2020 that let's go ahead and and let's consider giving more in 19 December. Let's give more in time, in talent, and in fueling the ministries of our church through through our tithes and offerings. What do you think, Judy? Let's do it. Okay. 
Yes, we believe and, and I believe um, that as you give to the Lord, uh, he'll return those blessings even more. Um, so as we leave today, we'll be taking uh, tithes and offerings at the exit doors. Um, always fill out your connect cards. We love praying for you guys. We love knowing that you were here. Um, let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for 2019. What an incredible year that was. Father, as we move into 2020, another year, another decade, um, I pray that this next year is the greatest year in our lives. Um, I pray that we are just on fire for you, um, that we just want everybody we come into contact with to know the love uh, that we know from you. Uh, So take these tithes and offerings, bless them, uh, just use them to expand your kingdom and to make greater your name. In your name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed and have a great New Year's.